Hey everyone, this is Mike from vSwitch Zero. So as you can see, I got all kinds of parts laid out in front of me. So you know what that means. Time for another build. So this is going to be my contribution to the Socket to Me 7 build off. And as the name implies, it has everything to do with Socket 7. So rather than exploring some of the higher performance Super Socket 7 platform stuff, or even the later Intel MMX uh, stuff that's out there, we're going to look at the total opposite end of the spectrum. We're going to look at the oldest Socket 7 stuff. So the very first uh, Intel CPU that uh, was officially Socket 7, the Pentium 133, and Intel's first uh, Socket 7 Pentium chipset as well, the Intel 430FX, which was uh, a very successful chipset back in around 1995. So I'm going to try to stay somewhat true to that 1995 uh, time frame, and uh, let's take a look at uh, all the parts I've selected for this build. Okay, so this is the uh, 430FX motherboard I'm going to be using here. Um, it's not branded, but I did do some digging online, just comparing jumpers and things like that, and I found out that it's made by a company called uh, Full Yes. I think uh, it was probably one of many you know, generic manufacturers that would put, put this together based on some kind of a reference design. You can see it's actually listed as Intel uh, 824301 version B here. That's really the only uh, notable marking that's on it, but uh, it is an earlier board. <clears throat> you can see that there are things on it that are very reminiscent of the uh, 486 era as opposed to really the later Pentium boards that everybody's used to seeing. The first thing that probably catches your eye is this async uh, SRAM that's on here uh, for cache as opposed to uh, the usual pipeline burst stuff that uh, the Pentiums are known for. And you can see that there's actually a couple of uh, traces here that you could technically solder on, but um, that was never included. There are actually jumpers too that sort of have, have hardwired bridges here uh, to enable it. Uh, I did find that in the manual as well. So uh, it won't be as fast using uh, async SRAM like this, but um, it, uh, it it's definitely showing its age, that's for sure. So although this is a Socket 7 board, um, you can see that there is a slot for a VRM module here. So this is the voltage regulation circuitry that's required for the uh, split plane voltage that Socket 7 introduces. The MMX processors use uh, a different voltage for I.O. and for the actual core. Um, and in order to do that on some of these older boards, you had to get the, the VRM module. So I don't have that. So that means that this board is limited to classic Pentium processors that run with a 3.3 volt uh, core. Um, this one does support EDO RAM. So the 430FX was the first Intel board that um, that took proper EDO RAM as opposed to the normal FPM stuff that you usually saw in 486 systems. So that's really great. I've got two sticks of 16 megs, <clears throat> 60 nanosecond uh, EDO here, which is great. Uh, it does have uh, a really good for the time uh, IDE controller. So I believe it's uh, on the PCI bus and it also does support bus mastering, which was quite new at the time. And I think the the uh, IDE performance was was quite good, and that's one thing the chipset was well known for. Uh, you can see we do have two IDE channels here, and we also have the floppy connection. There is a uh, parallel to serial port, as you would expect. Um, and there actually is, I don't know if you can see it there, but there are some pins at the very top here for PS2 mouse uh, support, and it is detected in Windows, so that's also a great, great positive there. It's a pretty beefy heat sink here for the uh, voltage regulation. And we've got uh, only three PCI slots. If this was a, a newer board, you might have an additional one there, but uh, but that's okay. Plenty for, for my needs. Um, you can see the Dallas RTC here has a newer date stamp on it. It's uh, the 21 at the beginning. Indicates that it was made this year, which is because I replaced it. And thankfully it is socketed. You can see there's a, a socket there, so very easy to replace. And uh, the one that was in there was this Odin jobber here, which is just a Dallas compatible chip. Uh, this is the one I pulled out of it. And it was completely dead. And that was preventing the system from booting, which is why it was sold originally as a defective part. 
So for this build, I'm going to use the Pentium 133. This was the first official Socket 7 CPU that Intel released. In actual fact, there's really not all that much different between this and, say, a Pentium 100, which is technically a Socket 5 processor. Um, these newer Pentium 133, 150, 166 were manufactured on the uh, 350 nanometer process. So was the 120 technically, but that CPU is a little bit special. I'm not going to go into too much of the differences here because it could turn into a very long video otherwise, but um, this uh, just some interesting facts. This 133 can indeed run in a Socket 5 system, even though it's not officially supported. So they're, the platforms are actually that close when it comes to the classic Pentiums. It does become a very different story when you start talking about the MMX processors, of course, with the split voltage uh, for core and IO and that sort of thing. But um, nonetheless, this is the very first Socket 7 CPU, so that's what we'll be using. On the video card front, I've got two cards here. So I've got a Matrox Millennium 2, which is I'm going to use as the uh, 2D card in the system. The uh, Matrox cards from around this time were really well known for their excellent picture quality. They had fantastic RAM DAX and uh, just gave you a really, really sharp picture. Uh, this is the Millennium 2 dated 1997 with, I think, 4 megs of RAM. It does have the expansion here if you want to uh, add a module for another 4. I'm not going to do any crazy resolutions, so that, uh, that should be fine for my purposes. Um, I believe there are some... Uh, 3D capabilities in this card, but I'm not going to be using it for that purpose. It's really just uh, a really sharp 2D card that I'm going to pair with the uh, the 3D accelerator. Um, I should mention as well that the Matrox is probably not the best choice if you're looking for old DOS game compatibility titles like Commander Keen will have scrolling issues with this particular card. But um, for the types of games that you'd see in 95 and, and later, it really is fine. It's not, uh, not going to be an issue. So uh, we'll go with that. For the 3D acceleration, I've got the trusty 3D effects Voodoo, the original. So this is the Diamond Monster 3D, dated 1997. Uh, this is probably the most popular uh, Voodoo card that, that you'll find out there. There were a lot of these made. Um, they're very solid and reliable. I haven't had any problems with this uh, and used it in many systems. Again, it's dated 1997, so probably a little bit new for this system, but it wasn't uncommon to see people adding uh, 3D accelerators into early Pentiums because the CPUs were starting to get a little bit constrained and then uh, if you can add an accelerator card like this to take the, the strain off the CPU you could have a really good gaming experience so that's uh, what I'm hoping to go for with this. So next up let's take a look at the audio card I'm going to use in, in the system here. So this is the Sound Blaster 32 plug and play. So you notice I didn't call it the AWE32 because this is actually um, the CT3600 that Creative uh, released without the AWE moniker. Interestingly, um, it seems to be less popular for that very reason, but to be honest, it, it's pretty much everything that an AWE card is. It has the EMU8000 chip here. It's got 512K of onboard memory for sound fonts. Um, and it even has the uh, the two 30-pin SIM sockets to add additional memory. So even though it may not be technically an AWE32, it certainly does just about all of those AWE32 things you'd expect. Um, so, I mean, on a positive note, they are cheaper and easier to find. Uh, there are quite a few of them out there. So if you're looking for that uh, wavetable goodness out of a uh, second generation Sound Blaster card, I don't know if you can call it second generation, but the SB32 line of cards, it's a great choice. And um, for me, it's worked really well, and I'm going to be using it in this build here. I do have uh, two Samsung 30-pin SIMs in here. They're one megabyte each. They're just some ones I had spare lying around from a, a dead 386 system that I, I salvaged. But um, it will take up to 28 megs of, of RAM for sound fonts. Now, 28 megs, you'd think that's kind of a weird size because you can't really get the normal 1, 4, 8 meg or even 16 meg sims to add up to 28 megs, but uh, you get that by putting two 16 meg sims in there, and then I guess uh, only 28 megs of the 32 total is addressable. So I'm hoping to get some, some bigger modules for this in the future. Uh, you can see there is a little jumper here to switch from the onboard 512K to the external memory slots. Uh, unfortunately, you can't use both at the same time, so if you do switch the jumper, you lose the 
the 512K there. It doesn't have uh, genuine OPL3. It does use Creative's FM synthesis, but that's okay. I mean, it's a bit of a trade-off. You do get the uh, the great sound font stuff that you can do with the uh, Sound Blaster 32 series, so I think that makes up for it to some degree. Um, the IO ports you can see here are pretty standard. It does have a line in in case you want to do external MIDI devices as well. And uh, yeah, it's got all of the normal inputs you'd expect for CD and aux and things like that up here as well. So for storage, I'm going to be using this uh, Fujitsu 6.5 gig drive. Um, unfortunately, the BIOS uh, on this board uh, has the 2 gig limitation, so anything larger than 2 gigs doesn't uh, detect or, or work correctly. But uh, thankfully, these uh, drives around this time have uh, a jumper configuration that can limit the size of the drive. So this green jumper here, as long as that's in place, the drive only reports itself as 2.1 gigabytes to get around that issue. So if you remember my slot one build off video, I actually used this drive and ran into some problems. I did some testing afterward and for whatever reason, it seems to be working just fine now. Um, I'm, it went through all kinds of full formats and disk checks and everything seems to be fine. I wrote all kinds of data to it, and um, so I'm going to give it another try here. Uh, I mean, it's probably not going to stay in the system permanently, but um, we will use it for now. So next up for network card, I've got a uh, 3Com Etherlink 3 here. Uh, it's dated 1994, a bit of an older ISA card, but uh, was a very popular one and has good support uh, in DOS and Windows. I believe in Windows 95 it's supported out of the box without even having to add any additional drivers. This one does have the one RJ45 port, but it does have the uh, AUI and uh, coax connect connector as well. And another interesting thing that I'm going to be throwing in this system, well I think it's interesting, a lot of people might think this is completely obsolete garbage, but uh, I have a an analog modem here. So this is a US Robotics 33.6 modem. Um, I'm hoping to use this system later on to connect to some BBSs using uh, real phone lines. So, uh, or maybe even do, up, do some dial up networking. I just want to be able to play around with it. So I'm going to throw it in there anyway. Um, if anything, it'll save me from having to find a, a slot cover once I get this system in the case. So uh, had a modem like this back in the day. I had a 56K internal as well. Uh, they're very solid and, and work well. So here's the case I'm going to use. So this is a, I guess you could call it a mid tower. It's not really a full tower, but it's uh, definitely bigger than some of the baby AT cases you see. Um, it, uh, I don't know what brand it is, but I did drive quite a long way to pick it up uh, years back when I saw a local classified ad for it. These AT cases are definitely getting hard to find. It was pretty dirty when I first got it. I mean, it was fully caked with all kinds of nastiness around the power button and uh, a lot of uh, deep cleaning seemed to get it looking a lot better. It did used to have this sort of uh, tinted plastic piece that you'd slide up and down here but uh, it was kind of falling off and didn't look good and also got kind of warped so I removed it. Um, this is actually not a floppy drive. Back in the day they used to put these sort of phony looking uh, filler plates in here that just look like drive so this is actually the only floppy drive in this in the uh, three and a half inch bays. Uh, this is a five and a quarter 1.2 meg drive that I picked up a while back. I haven't really used it yet so I'm kind of interested to see if it works. The optical drive in here I don't even know if it uh, if it works. It was giving me some problems a while back so I'm going to try it out. If it doesn't work I'll swap it out for something else but it does actually blend in pretty good with the case. It's a bit yellowed so it could use some retrobiting at some point but um, this is what I'll, I'll use. I do like that it has the megahertz display here. It'll go up to 199 I guess if you if you want it to go that high. So the 133 um, I'll have to modify it for that value there. It does have a working turbo button as well which is cool and uh, the key lock. So it's probably a bit older than what you'd see for a Pentium system. Uh, when I first got it the megahertz display was set to 33 so that kind of tells you that it was more than likely uh, an earlier 486 system in here. The power supply that I have in here, it's actually a brand new Athena Power 300 watt AT power supply. You still can buy them new. They're a bit pricey, but um, I did pick that one up a while back and it works great. So anyway, hopefully uh, hopefully the system will work well in here. So before I reassemble the system, I just want to get this uh, VFD megahertz display set up properly. I did uh, find the documentation for it, thankfully. There was a site online that has uh, all of the different jumper configuration for all the segments. So that was really helpful. 
the um, you can see here there's a huge bank of jumpers so if you don't have documentation for this uh, it'll be a really frustrating experience trying to experiment and get the uh, the segments set up correctly. Not only is there ju a jumper to be set for each of the segments you want to display, there's also a setting for both turbo and non-turbo modes. So I have this little switch uh, connected at the back here just to sort of simulate when the turbo button's pressed and you can see that uh, it switches between so it makes it easier to to check to make sure you've done it correctly. Anyway, I'm pretty happy with that and I think that uh, that works well. Um, just another tip too, if you ever do need to do this, grab yourself a little external power supply or if you have a PC power supply to feed it 5 volts. It can be a really frustrating experience trying to set these while it's actually mounted in the case because you won't have good visibility and getting all of these individual jumpers in the right position can be a real exercise in frustration. So I'll get this mounted back up now. Alright, so I got the uh, system all assembled in the case, and overall I'm pretty happy with how it looks. There is a little bit of a mess of cables up here, but that's kind of unavoidable when you've got uh, two floppy drives, an optical drive, and a hard drive all in the front bays, so um, that's okay. The uh, You can see there's actually a fair bit of space in this case above the motherboard, and that's because this is what, what they refer to as a baby AT motherboard, where it's only about, uh, you know three-quarter height and then you've got that additional space at the top for full-size AT motherboards. You don't see those too often but um, they are around and uh, they will fit in this case. So for the expansion cards, the first one here is the 3DFX Voodoo. Below that you've just got a little PCI bracket here that uh, includes the COM port uh, headers so they just plug into the board for two serial ports. Below that's the uh, Matrox Millennium 2 got the 3Com Etherlink uh, network card here, the modem, and then the Sound Blaster 32 plug and play. Um, the front uh, uh, LED connectors and switches were a little bit confusing. I had to um, dig up the uh, information in the manual to make uh, make that happen. Things like the power LED, for example, it actually hooks up to the uh, some of the key lock pins, so it's it's a bit weird. But uh, in the end, I got it uh, got it going. So let's uh, take a look at the back of the case. So as you can see, there's a huge mess of ports on the back of this system, uh, which is not uncommon when you're talking about AT motherboards and cases. Not like the ATX days where you've got a nice clean I.O. shield here with everything neatly neatly placed. So when it comes to AT, you know, you've got the only thing on the, on the actual motherboard is just this uh, keyboard DIN connector. Everything else has to be provided through header ports and either brackets or these little punch outs here. So you can see, like I said before, the, the serial ports, they just are sitting on a bracket here and there's two cables that connect to the motherboard. I could put them in these punch outs, but um, I don't know what the final configuration is going to be, so I didn't want to do that quite yet. The uh, 3D effects Voodoo does add uh, some complexity here as well. So you've got the VGA input at the top as well as the VGA output. And of course the uh, 2D card has to pass through its graphics to the, the Voodoo using one of these pass-through cables. Um, I couldn't find one of these, but uh, after looking around, I actually did find a pack of 10 of them on Amazon. So I've got quite a few of these now, but this, uh, this cable works quite well and it's nice and short, so it doesn't clutter things too badly. Also for the uh, the keyboard here, this is the standard AT DIN style connector, but uh, you can use any PS2 keyboard um, just fine with one of these PS2 to DIN uh, adapters. So that's uh, that's what I use here. And yeah, so audio connections at the bottom here. So you've got uh, both amplified and line out as well as line in and a microphone connection. And uh, yep, RJ45 for the network card here. So anyway, let's... Uh, get this thing turned around and booted up. So to get started here, let's configure the AWE32, or should I say the Sound Blaster 32. So you can see here in the uh, AWE control panel, you can set your uh, sound bank or sound fonts. I have one loaded right now that's using almost all of the two megs. I've got a couple here. There's one called Fine GM that I found, and there's also the uh, two megabyte EMU one, which is the one from Creative Labs. So I'm just switching to that one here. And you can see it doesn't quite use all uh, two megabytes, but pretty close. 
Another thing you'll want to make sure too is that you go to the actual control panel MIDI configuration. Uh, this is just the Windows uh, part of it. And under the MIDI tab you want to make sure that the uh, Creative Advanced Wave Effects or Creative AWE is selected. Um, if you want to hear the uh, normal OPL3 emulation, you could select it from there as well. So let's uh, hear the difference between some of these in games. So probably the best title to test uh, MIDI music is Heretic. This one has an awesome soundtrack and I think it really brings out the uh, difference as well. So this is a 2 megabyte sound font called Fine GM that I found online. As you can hear, the sound is very different than the FM synthesis uh, you heard in the previous clip. And uh, this definitely takes MIDI music to the next level, that's for sure. So another really fun game is Need for Speed SE. So this is actually the demo version where you only get to play one car and one track, but I remember playing this over and over again when I got my first uh, 3DFX Voodoo card. Uh, I was really blown away by the effects, and today it actually looks a lot choppier than I remember, but that's sort of the way retro gaming works. Uh, frame rates were, if you were anywhere near 20 or 30 back then, that was quite good, but um, still a lot of fun, and I actually played uh, quite a few laps of this, uh, and it brought back a lot of memories. So next up is Diablo. I played this game a lot back when it was first released. Initially it was on my Pentium 100 system and I do remember it struggling a bit to keep up with it. It had some really creepy moments and I remember it being pretty difficult actually, but uh, I did beat it in the end.
So one of my favorite early 3D titles was Turok Dinosaur Hunter, released in 1997. So I remember playing this quite a bit when I got my first uh, 3DFX Voodoo card back in the day. It was originally developed for Nintendo 64, but the PC port of it is quite good and very playable with uh, early 3D hardware. So the great thing about having a, a system of this age with Windows 95 and an ISA sound card is that you can enjoy a lot of the old DOS classics. So here's uh, Doom playing with the Creative CQ MFM synthesis. So I had some trouble getting 3 d Mark 99 to run on this system. In the end, the problem turned out to be the 3DFX drivers. I had to get the uh, the latest Diamond drivers for the Monster 3D, and that seemed to fix the problem. Uh, because of the age of the card, it is limited to 640 by 480 so the results here may not be comparable to uh, some of the others running at 800 by 600 I also had to enable double buffering, too, in order to get the uh, display to, to look half decent. So it is a, a pretty demanding title for an older 3D card, so the score or doesn't really look all that great, but uh, there it is nonetheless. So let's take a look at the 3D effects difference. So here's a time demo of Quake running at 640 by 480 with the software render. And as you can see, it's very choppy. The uh, result here is about 10 frames per second. I won't put you through the pain and agony of watching the, uh, the whole thing. But uh, this uh, coming up here is a switch over to the uh, 3D effects GL Quake version. And as you can see, at 640 by 480, the same resolution, it is much, much smoother. You get the enhanced uh, 3D effects as well as an added bonus. And if you were to run the time demo with the software render at 320 by 200, which is the default uh, DOS uh, resolution for it, um, you'd actually get about the same frame rate of about 26 point. 26.8 frames per second. So at the time, uh, to run a 3D FX Voodoo graphics accelerator, it was a game changer. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed this video. The Pentium era is a very nostalgic time for me, so it was a lot of fun putting the system together and revisiting some of these old games. If you'd like to see more retro PC content like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.